Welcome to Original Mind Zen Sangha in Princeton, New Jersey. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Johnson Miller. From right livelihood to right lifestyle. Um, so I think whether it's uh, Siddhartha himself or whoever came up with the dateful path was uh, clearly thinking about lay people like us. Uh, otherwise, there wouldn't have been a need for right livelihood. Monks and nuns don't have livelihoods, right? I mean, I guess unless that is real livelihood. But um, the purpose of the Eightfold Path is, of course, to provide this framework that where we transform our behaviors, our, our, our lives, and our practice uh, to reducing uh, cravings and the various obstructions in our practice, as well as, of course, cultivating an effective practice leading to uh, nirvana. It's you know, purely pragmatic. And within that right livelihood seems to be about um, um, avoiding habit patterns that produce the, the, the three poisons, hatred, greed, and delusion, uh, as well as reducing the suffering that we cause to others. Uh, and so, you know, back 2,500 years ago, the idea was don't be a butcher and uh, don't make a living making weapons. Uh, you know, if you're a butcher, you're going to kill animals and chop them up into little pieces and they're on the blood and it's just, it's going to create all these images uh, and all the suffering that's going to upset your your practice and, and so forth. So that's not good. Uh, and there's also other things like living within your means and being content so you're not always craving, you know, to buy more crap or, um, you know, or to become a, a, debt, a slave to uh, debts or whatever. Uh, but it was pretty, it seemed pretty simple and straightforward what right livelihood meant. 2,500 years ago. Um, and so it seems the Eiffel Path kind of splits up, say, production versus consumption. You know, back then, everybody was primarily a producer, right? Everybody made something. I mean, unless you were a merchant, maybe, or, uh, or a landlord who lived off the labor of others, including your, you know, your slaves. Um, but the right you know, it is about how you deal with production in your life. Um, and Thing, the issues of consumption are kind of spread throughout the um, uh, the, the precepts and some other uh, other paths. <clears throat> but um, you know, th the fifth century Ganges Valley was where Buddhism developed was really different from industrial modernity. Um, there was, you know, every, like I said, everybody was a, a producer. Everything that at least most people would use was produced locally uh, from local materials with local labor. Uh, and so the, the sources and the conditions of one's production, things were all pretty obvious to you. Um, you. And the waste that came from producing stuff or from consuming stuff, you knew where that went because you probably went and dumped the stuff in the midden pile or dumped it into the river yourself. And so people tended to have an intimate knowledge of the, the consequences of their consumption and of uh, their production. But today, with industrial um, modernity produces this um, uh, global interdependence of both production and, and consumption. And so nothing is obvious anymore about where your stuff comes from or where the waste from it goes. And so, um, you know, I mean, places around the world are different and things differ depending on, on class. But at least in the West, even, you know, the poorest people are part of this global interdependence where just eating a meal relies, I mean, almost literally on everybody in the world because of stuff coming from other countries, the stuff that you used to cook with being produced in various countries, the shipping that occurs. And so you might eat some fruit that was picked a thousand miles away or 5,000 miles away by someone who you've never seen or never will see. They're the ones who get the pesticides sprayed on them while they're uh, harvesting the, the fruit. They're the ones who here in the United States perhaps um, get their wages stolen from them and uh, under the threat that if they don't accept that, they'll uh, be reported to uh, immigrations and custom enforcement. Uh, and then, you know, but that's okay. I mean, it's very far away. Um, and so it needn't disturb your meditation or, or, uh, or evoke any empathy from you. Um, and then the plastic that the fruit become, comes wrapped in, of course, you know, you throw that away and somebody else takes it away for you. You don't know where it goes and you don't see it get dumped into the ocean where a whale swallows it and has their digestion ruined and they die. You know, and that's all very far away. It's invisible. So uh, again, it doesn't have to disturb your meditation or, or evoke any, any empathy from you. 
And then the production and the shipping of, of the plastic and the fruit and all of that, producing the pesticides for it, you don't see the CO2 go into the air and uh, produce uh, climate change. So as you eat the fruit, you're, it's, there's no apparent connection between that and um, increasing intensity of storms and uh, droughts and so forth. And again, it's all invisible, so it doesn't have to upset your meditation or, or evoke your any, uh, any empathy from you. You know, of course, I'm being you know, facetious here, you know, but if you, I guess if you think about it quite literally in terms of right livelihood, you know, maybe that none of that stuff really does matter because if you're all the suffering that you participate in is invisible and it's not actually affecting your, um, your, your meditation, then, you know, maybe that's, that's fine. Maybe as long as that consumption doesn't generate the hatred, hatred, greed, and delusion, maybe it's fine, except that so many of us, our consumption is our hatred, our greed, and our delusion. Uh, you know, in terms of hatred, you know, when we can consume things where the the production of it or the waste from it, the way we do it in a way that we don't think about how it affects other people. Uh, the 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 greed. I mean, the we consume in ways that fulfill so many un you know things that aren't real needs. These sort of unnecessary cravings. Um, the, the delusion, there's just the, the ignorance we have of the, the reality of the situation, where these things come from, the consequences of our production and, and consumption. You know, the things are um, just thinking about right livelihood as a path and its relation to our practice. I mean, today, under industrial modernity, everything's just too complex and, and interdependent. Uh, not being a, a butcher or an arms manufacturer isn't enough uh, today, perhaps that you know, it takes a serious effort today as compared to 2,500 years ago in the Ganges Valley to be aware of the consequences of our consumption. Um, and, and it's impossible to consume without uh, generating suffering for others because of all this interconnectedness. Um, it's, and that was always true, right? I mean, there's always people's consumption was gonna produce suffering for others. Uh, but in the past, that the consequence, consequence of that was much more apparent, much more obvious. You could respond much more to the, um, to the, the consequences of your production and, and consumption in ways you can't today. Uh, oh, and you should also say that I mean, we should recognize the ways in which industrial modernity has also alleviated suffering, particularly in terms of hunger or, um, or, or disease or um, you know, providing medical care, right? Though I mean, it hasn't done anything to make it more likely that people are gonna you know, strive for nirvana or be more concerned about the suffering of others. Uh, but regardless, we, um, so we have this industrial modernity that creates this technological infrastructure that, that insulates us from the consequences of our actions, from the consequences of our, of our consumption. Uh, and it also produces new um, immediate hindrances. I mean, think about modern media, which produces new sorts of cravings, new even new addictions, where it can I mean readily you know, fill our minds with uh, harmful and distracting images, uh, repetitive images. You know, it can cycle through our heads, which are you know an immediate impediment to our practice, and that cultivate greed, hatred, and, and delusion. Um, so, like social media, there's that, that dopamine hit that comes from uh, getting responses on social media the instant gratification of, of 24 hour news networks or just being able to look up um, news updates uh, on, online, just the, the torrent of, uh, of violent and pornographic imagery that's, that's available. It's like a, this media, it's, it's like, our, like the modern Western diet where the, the, the sugar and fat of the modern Western diet where it's you know, this low quality harmful media, it, it's ever, ever present, instantly accessible uh, abundant and, and pulls at us uh, constantly. Um, so given these, these new technological cravings and the way that industrial technology shields us from the consequences of our actions, I wonder if we need to rethink right livelihood, which is you know, simpler or more narrow, rethink it as right lifestyle. Uh, that is not just about avoiding an overtly harmful profession, or about being honest in our in our work, which is important, um, but perhaps we need to make much more of an effort to um, be mindful of how our, our consumption harms others, how it how it distracts us or create habits habit patterns 
um, and how it all the system and inevitably embeds us in these harmful systems. So I mean, there's no like there's no purity to be had here, right? Um, our living demands suffering of others, and which doesn't let us off the hook for that. In fact, it makes it all the more urgent that we take responsibility. And not that I have an answer for that. I mean, I'm a terrible example. Every time I get into a car, I think about this uh, journalist a few years ago, but he wrote, uh, he, he said, uh, we are all climate deniers. And, and his point was, every time you get in a car and drive, you're basically engaged in a suicide mission because you are, you know, you're pumping the CO2 out. That CO2 isn't going anywhere for a few thousand years. You are, you're jacking up the heat. Um, and so industrial modernity, I mean, it's bigger than any of us. We're, we're embedded in infrastructures that we can't escape. You know, I mean, I was born into a mid 20th century American settlement system that promoted car culture and having to drive everywhere. And, um, you know, I mean, I, as an individual, I can't really fix that. Um, it, you know, just in and of myself, uh, keeping harmful plastics out of the ecosystem, uh, halting climate change. I mean, these are, these are big things that are about much larger uh, systems. It's a job of more than just an individual and you can't opt out of it. You know, I mean, you can go, you know, start a farm or something and, but even all the tools, everything that you do to make that happen is, it's still coming from out, out of that. Um, we're all implicated. And so I think perhaps empathy for our failings would of course have to be part of this right livelihood, right lifestyle. Um, so right lifestyle calls us to be deliberate in how we live in the world. Um, how, how does one, um, one's entire lifestyle support or hinder one's practice? How does it uh, support or harm other beings? How does our entire lifestyle, um, or how, how do we engage and live with the inevitable harm that arises out of our, our uh, individual lifestyles? And how do we navigate the, the complexity and the inter interdependence just to, to find something resembling or moving towards uh, the right lifestyle? All of this is, is, is um, complex and interdependent as the industrial modernity that we're uh, that we're living in so no simple um, no simple answer to this I mean this is um, just this, this is a, a lifelong uh, a lifelong project um, but that that complexity and interdependence I think calls us to to look beyond right livelihood to something more like right lifestyle